words be your words. Yes, Lord. And Father God, my deepest prayer today is to use me, not in my flesh, Father God. But Father God, you come and do what I cannot do. And that's delivered this message that you've given me. Let them get it and receive it just yes, as I did. Lord Jesus. Father God, let it be revelation. Let it be rain. Thank you, Father God. Good morning. Good morning. <coughs> Good morning. Let me get kind of situated. Did everybody get a little box? We have a basket on the table there. Grab one before you go out. <coughs> Y'all have to excuse me a moment. Okay, so we are going to be talking about dressing up properly. And that sounds crazy for a for a Valentine's message, but God has a reason for it. We are going to learn how to dress up properly for things that we've been invited to. Has anybody in here ever been invited to a party or a function? We're going to take, for instance, let's just say you received an invitation. You're at work. You receive an invitation. The only thing you were really concerned about, and this is for your fault. Now, your boss is a little crazy. He's a little outspoken, likes to play pranks. Kind of reminds me of Rich a little bit. <laughs> and just, just picture that for a moment. The only thing you focus on is the date, <coughs> the time, and the location. You miss the fine print on the bottom of this invitation. <laughs> now, you're thinking, well, this is for, we'll just say boss Rich, and we know that he is, he's a jokester. He likes to joke. He likes to be the light of the party. But this time you're thinking, hmm, I'm going to show up to this party, dress the way that I think he would dress to come to mine. So the day comes and it gets there and all of a sudden you decide you're going to dress in a costume. Not realizing the location, and the attire that was mentioned in the fine print of this invitation at the bottom. So you get there, the doors swing wide open, and you walk in there, and you're dressed with your partner that's with you, your plus one, and you're dressed like Doug and Emu off of the Liberty Mutual commercial. <laughs> now, everybody in there is dressed in their Sunday's best. Boss Rich looks over and goes, what were you thinking? Did you not read the invitation? Did you not see that I personally invited you? So you kind of get those looks on your face. Well, I found some people. Go ahead. This is some of the costumes that I kind of thought might qualify. Now, I will add, I, I will add, there is a person in there, by the way. I will add that these are actual clothing. These are not costumes, y'all. These are not costumes. This is from a, a high-dollar fashion show. So, Rich, on your birthday coming up, we're all going to go out and get some of these and wear it to your party. Okay, next slide. But then you have crazy people oh. like this. I don't know what this person was thinking, but that's Myrtle and Pastor Louise. Now, being properly dressed can be a nightmare, actually. Has this ever happened to you? You go to sleep at night. Y'all, this is so funny. You go to sleep at night. You have this dream. You've been called to give a word at your church, which you guys will start to be getting called soon. And you have this dream in the middle of the night. And in my case, I'm giving a sermon that I'm not knowing about, only to realize that I'm saying, now this is the dream, that I only to realize that I'm standing in front of the church, or it could be school, giving a word at your school, or it could be doing something at, at work. But you realize that you're standing there in your undies. <laughs> Or even worse, what about your birthday suit? Oh. Now, I was always told that if you have to speak in front of a bunch of people and you're nervous, just picture them sitting in their undies. But that wasn't the dream. It was me standing in front of you. 
That will never happen. So don't have any fear. God has not called me to that. So anyway, I was thinking about that. And, and so I want to talk about being properly dressed. Because we're going to talk about an invitation that some people received. And it's to a wedding feast. So we can go to the next slide. That can go. We can go to the next slide. Now I'm going to try to work between these two pair of glasses so y'all work with me. Ooh, hold on. It's a little warm. Wipe off the fog. So I'm going to be reading out of the Passion. Most of what I'm doing today is going to be out of the Passion. So just listen to what takes place. It says, as was the custom, Jesus continued to teach the people by using analogies, al- allegories, sorry. And he illustrated the reality of heaven's kingdom realm by saying, There once was a king who arranged an extravagant wedding feast for his son. One day the um, festivities were set to begin. He sent his servants to summon all who were invited, all the invited guests. But But they chose not to come. So the king sent out even more servants to inform the invited guests, saying, Come to the sumptuous feast. It's now ready. The oxen and the fattened cattle have been killed and everything is prepared. So come. Come to the wedding feast for my son and his bride. But the invited guests were not impressed. One was preoccupied with his business. Another went off to his farming enterprise. And the rest seized the king's messengers and shamely mistreated them. And even some were killed. Now imagine that. This infuriated the king. So he sent his soldiers to execute those murderers and had their cities burned to the ground. This is serious, y'all. Then the king said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready. Yet those who had been invited to attend didn't deserve the honor. Now I want you to go into the streets and the alleyways and invite everyone, um, anyone and everyone that you find to come and enjoy the wedding feast in honor of my son. So the servants went out into the streets and invited everyone to come to the wedding feast, the good and the bad alike, until the banquet hall was crammed with people. Now then the king entered the banquet hall and he looked with glee over the guests. But then he noticed a guest who was not wearing a wedding robe that was provided for him. Okay, He said, my friend, how is it that you are here and you're not wearing your wedding garment? But the man was speechless. Then the king turned to his servant and said, tie him up and throw him into outer darkness where there will be great sorrow with weeping. And gnashing of teeth, for everyone is invited to enter in, but few respond in excellence. Okay, so it's really important to understand here that we have a wedding going on. This king is really wanting to do his best to honor his son. He sent out all these invitations to elect people, chosen people. Some decided they wasn't going to be there. They had more important things to do. They had excuses to make. And we're going to learn a little bit about that. So he sent, you know, it said he sent out the servants to take care of those people. It's one thing to receive an invitation to something. But when you take, when the person comes and delivers, you get the knock on the door and it's the king's servants. And they hand you an invitation you don't kill the messenger. You, you don't scoff the messenger. You are being invited by the king. The king. You know, and, and it's like, I, I still don't get that. I, I can't wait if I get the opportunity to meet those people. What were you thinking? So anyway, it goes on to say, and it's something that I really want to reiterate, is that he said anyone and everyone. That means even the common folk. That means even those country bumpkins out there. And that includes us, the misfits. Yeah. 
Who's a misfit? Amen. I'm a, I, am, I am the queen of misfits. And I'm getting invited. Okay? So I want to also take and take another look, because this, of course, is in the Gospels. Luke has something to say about this. So we're going to go over and we're going to look in Luke. Luke 14. I don't hear no pages turning. You never know when you're going to be called out to read something. Got to get them pages moving. It says in verse 16, Jesus replied. Now, this is from Luke's perspective. Before we were looking at Matthew, Luke's is a little softer, a little less militant. Okay? It says, a man invited many to join him at a great feast. When the day of the feast arrived, the host instructed the servant to notify all the invited guests and tell them, come for everything is ready for you. Um, but one by one, they all made excuses. How many times have we made excuses when it comes to the house of the Lord? How many times have we made excuses, you know, of, I have a headache. My tummy hurts. Uh, my children decided to plan a birthday on this day at this time, knowing I'm supposed to be in the house of God. You know, so there's little things like that. So one by one, they had excuses. And one said, I can't come. I just bought some property and I have to go look it over. Another one said, please accept my regards for I just purchased five teams of oxen and I need to make sure that they can pull their weight or, or be able to pull the plow. Another one said, I can't come. I just got married. I get that. The servant responded back to the host and told him all their excuses. The master became angry and said to his servant, Go at once throughout the city and, and invite anyone you find, the poor, the blind, the disabled, the hurting, and the lonely. Invite them to my banquet. And when the servant returned to the master, he said, Sir, I have done what you asked, but there's still room for more. So the master told him, all right, go out again. And this time, bring them all back with you. Persuade the beggars on the street, the outcasts, even the homeless, and insist that they come and enjoy the feast so that my house may be full. So I said to you, I say to you, I say to you all, that one who receives an invitation to a feast with me and makes excuses will ever enjoy my banquet. So in studying this, I've learned that, you know, given the particulars of it, the excuses that these guys had, I mean, they were, they were legit. But why would you give up the opportunity to sup with the king? Why would you not want to be there? So in studying this, I found something from Dr. Philip McClarty. He says, years ago, a friend had put this all together in a song for me. And he was, he was teaching a lesson like this. And he put it to the tunes of the Beverly Hillbillies. I may need your help, Rich. So hit that slide. So I want you to think of where this song goes and sing these words.
you. You know, if that doesn't, if that doesn't make you think, you know, and, and this man used this in a service, but he learned the song before he did it. I couldn't get it right. So Lord have mercy on me. Okay, so go to the next slide. So whenever your excuses, whatever your excuses are, <laughs> we're going to have to save that for your part. So whatever your excuses, the kingdom must go on. So whether you make an excuse, he's not going to wait for you till next week to give a message that may have been something that you really needed. So if you get an invitation to go to church, go to church. It could be that very day that the feast is going to be served. You don't want to miss. God is at work reconciling the world to himself. How many have been going through things that you just wonder, you know, God, what is, what, what? is this ever going to be right? Is this ever going to be okay? Just know that God is at work reconciling the world and and i hate to break it to some of y'all you're part of that world you live here on earth so you're part of that reconciliation but you have some choices to make if we're too busy for whatever reason and unwilling to be a part of the ministry of reconciliation just know this god will choose others to do his bidding if you've been called to teach and you're not standing up and teaching in the day and age that we live. Know that God will skip your gift and give it to somebody else that will get up and do it. That's right. If God's called you to sing, <clears throat> if God's called you to sing and to lead worship, that means you get up and you do what God's called you to do. Laura, yeah. do you hear that? If God's called you to do that, do it. Because the days are short. If you don't, God will find somebody who will and won't give him excuses. This is, look, I was like, okay, Father, I hear you. I'm sinking down in my chair going, I am in trouble. Because there's things that I've let my surroundings get in the way. Being held back from what God's called me to do. And I'm praying that God will continue the work that he's doing now because there's a, there's a boldness coming up in me that I've never had before. And I know that it's the reconciliation that the Lord's doing within me. And he's going to start it in each and every one of us. We need to realize that the kingdom of God is at hand and that we are the honored guest. If you're here, it's because God's honored you. Because you are honored. You're his. You're his child. So word to the wise, you've seen those outfits before on the thing? Dress accordingly. And what do I mean by that? You can go to the next slide. According to Matthew, as the king mixed and mingled with his guests, he noticed the one not wearing the proper wedding garments. So he had that one person tied and bound and carried out. Now, at first, when I saw the picture, I'm like, but Lord, you're a God of love. You're a God of peace and joy and righteousness. Why would you have somebody show up at your banquet and then throw them out? Well, the footnote for that particular scripture, which was in Matthew 22, 11, this is what the footnote says. It says, those invited to come from the streets had no opportunity to buy wedding clothes. This wedding robe is a picture of a garment of righteousness. That's what the wedding garment is. It's a garment of righteousness that grace provides for you. You didn't have to make it. You didn't have to go buy it. It's provided for you. A man without the wedding garment had one provided. It was given to him. But he did not want to change out of his own clothes. He didn't want to put on the robe of righteousness. He was accepting himself for who he was. Remember that they invited all of those on the street, the homeless, the hurting, those that needed to be healed, those that were misfits, those that were outcasts. 
That's who's invited, that he's one of those, but didn't see himself worthy enough to put on the robe of righteousness, the garment of righteousness, okay? A change is necessary for the king provides the garments for us, and they are white linen for all of us to wear. They are our wedding garments. How many in here can truly say that they have put on the garment of righteousness? I had to repent. I mean, I'll just be transparent. I had to repent. And as I was studying and praying this week, I had to physically get up out of prayer and go take something white and throw over myself as a rep rep to represent the garment of righteousness. Just so that my mind could see it. Just so my eyes could see it. That God has clothed me with righteousness. And I've had that prophesied over me. But I never received it. It was like I'm too dirty. But but you don't know my past. I've gone through some things. How could I ever put something so brilliant, so white, so pure upon these shoulders? How could I do that? And I had to let God do a washing. I had to allow him to do some cleansing. And he's still doing it. It's a continual job. It's not like you throw this on and all of a sudden everything's hunky-dory. You have to work at this. Okay? So the implication is that the guest who was not wearing the festive garment had simply come along for the ride. He didn't show up for the right reason. He wasn't there to honor the king or to celebrate the marriage. He was there to scarf up the food and to drink and to crash the party. He was a wedding crasher. How many of us have been wedding crashers? Back in the day, I was a wedding crasher. The way he dressed could even be interpreted as a sign of disdain. The king had every reason to throw him out. Imagine, imagine, you two are newlyweds. Imagine somebody showing up at your wedding and being dressed like they just got, I don't know, like some of them people. How would you feel? Would you feel dishonored? Would you feel like, well, what are they here for? Who are they? And then all they did was come in and scarf up all the food and drank up all the wine and and took over and everything? We don't want to be like that. So that's why. The way that we dress could even be interpreted as a sign of disdain. So he did. The king had every right to throw him out. But there's more to this. In the Bible, I found out that clothes have symbolic meanings. They are a sign of being dressed in the righteousness of God. For example, this is what Paul tells the Ephesians in Ephesians 4. 22 through 24. He says, and he taught, he taught you to let go of lifestyles of the ancient man, the old self, which is corrupted by sinful and deceitful desires that spring from delusions. Now it's time to, now it's time to be made new in every revelation that's been given to you and to be transformed as you embrace the glorious Christ within as your new life and live in union with him. For God has recre- for God has recreated you all over again in his perfect righteousness and now, be- and now you belong to him in the realm of true holiness. Y'all, we've been made new. The old man has died and gone away and the new man has been created. How many of us have received that in our life? Truly received it. There's times when the enemy kept trying to bring that old man back up. And say, that's not who you are. That's not who you are. And I said, oh, wait a minute. What does he say in Ephesians 4? I am a new creation. I I, I put that old man to bed forever. He is buried. And we need to keep that mindset in our mind. God is calling us now more than ever to put on Christ 
and to bear witness to his his grace and love in the world around us. And now we're going to read Colossians. Let's see how fast I can find it this time. In just one second. We're going to Colossians 3. All right, Lord, my fingers are not working. We are going to Colossians 3, I can assure you. <laughs> okay, so we're going to go to Colossians 3, and it's going to be 5 through 14. I know it's kind of long. Live as one who has died to every form of sexual sin and impurity. Live as one who has died to the desires of forbidden things, including the desire for wealth, which is the essence of idol worship. When you live in these vices, you ignite the anger of God. I love the way the passage puts that. You ignite the anger of God against those acts of disobedience. That's how you how you once believed or behaved, characterized by your evil deeds. But now it's time to eliminate them from our lives once and for all. These are the things that he wants us to eliminate once and for all. Anger, fits of rage. All forms of hatred, cursing, filthy speech, and lying. Lay aside your old Adam self, for it masquerades and disguises who you really are. For you have acquainted new, for you have acquainted a new created, a created life, which is continually being renewed in the likeness of the one who created you, giving you the full revelation of God. In this creation life, your nationality makes no difference. I don't care if you're from Spain. I don't care if you're from London. I don't care if you're from Cuba. I don't care if you're from Puerto Rico. Your nationality makes no difference. Nor does your eth eth ethnicity, education, or economic status. They matter nothing. Nothing. It's a good thing that he doesn't go by the nationality part because I'm Heinz 57. I'm a little bit of everything. For in Christ, that means everything as he lives in every one of us. Every one of us. It goes on to say <clears throat> that you are always and dearly loved by God. So robe yourself with the virtues of God. Since you have been divinely chosen to be holy, be merciful as you endeavor to understand others. Husbands and wives, that's for you. We have to learn to be merciful as you endeavor and understand others. And be compassionate, showing kindness towards all. Be gentle and humble, unoffendable in your patience with others. To not allow things to get to us. Not to get not to get to us. Okay? Tolerate the weaknesses of those in the family of faith. Forgiving one another in the same way you have been graciously forgiven by Jesus Christ. If you find fault in someone, release the same gift of forgiveness to them. That's a tough one. When you have loved ones and people you care about and something happened and you realize that the word of God says you have to forgive them and then you have to forgive them with the same gift of forgiveness that God forgave you, that's a biggie. But I can tell you it works. I can tell you God moves when you trust him. For love is supreme and must flow through each of these virtues, love becomes the mark of true maturity. You want to know if you've matured in Christ? Go back and read this in Colossians 3. Are you doing what that says you're do to do? That's how you'll know if you're growing in maturity. Because it's maturity that's going to get us through. Yes. You can go to the next slide. <clears throat> To be clothed in righteousness of God is to be immersed in the teachings of Jesus and filled with his spirit. This is what Paul said to the Ephesians. 
And I know this is one of pastor's favorite scriptures. And, and we'll learn why. It says in Ephesians 6, starting at 11, it says, Put on God's complete set of armor, provided for us. Did you catch that? It's provided for us. So that you will be protected as you fight against the evil strategies of the accuser. Your hand-to-hand -hand combat is not with human beings, but with the highest principalities and authorities operating in rebellion under the heavenly realms. Okay? For they are pow for they are a powerful class of demon what? gods and evil spirits that hold this dark world in bondage. Because of this, you must wear all the armor that God provides so that you're protected as you confront the uh, slanderer. For you are destined for all things and will rise victorious. So if we go armed in this battle with the armor that's been provided for us, we're going to be victorious. But imagine, if you will, if you were to go over to the Ukraine and try to help them fight, and you go into that battle with nothing but your jammies. You're going to get your lunch eaten. You better go into that battle knowing that you have a breastplate on, knowing that you have a salvation, of, you know, the helmet of salvation, knowing that you have your feet shod with the preparation, knowing that you have the shield of faith, but most importantly, the sword of the spirit. All of that's been given to you, the belt of truth. You've got to go into this battle fully dressed. Okay? It says, put on the belt of um the belt to strengthen you to stand in triumph. Put on the whole of the holiness as the protective armor that covers your heart. Stand on your feet alert. Then you'll always be ready to share the blessings of peace. In every battle, take faith as your wraparound shield. I love the way they said that. Your wraparound shield. A lot of times when we think about the, the shield of faith, we only think of the one shield that we hold. Passion translate, it's a wraparound. He's got you from the front. He's got you from the back. He's got you from the sides. You are wrapped and protected. For, the, for this shield is able to extinguish the blazing arrows coming at you from every angle, north, south, east, and west. Embrace the power of salvation's full deliverance, like the helmet to protect your thoughts from lies. How many of us will put on part of the armor and leave the helmet off? And then we have all these lies bombarding us all around us. You can't leave one piece out. Take the mighty razor-sharp spirit sword of the spoken word of God. So this person that I have here, he is fully dressed, ready for battle. And because he is, he will rise victorious. And we need to remember that. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> Here's the catch. The catch is we have to be able to, we have to be willing and able to wear all of this. And not only on Sundays. We have to get up every day and ask God to dress us. Ask God to put on the armor before us. Ask him to give us everything that we need for that day. You can go to the next slide. We come to church on Sunday mornings and, and singing um, God's praise and celebrating God's goodness and talking about this new creation of forgiveness, acceptance. And reconciliation in Christ. Yet no sooner, I'll paraphrase on, yet no sooner we walk out these doors, what happens? There's an argument in the car. Well, where do you want to eat? I don't know. Where do you want to eat? I don't know. What do you want? I don't know. Oh, come on. Just make up your mind. Where do you want to go? We just left church. Come on. I'll argue with myself now because I'm here. I'll argue with myself on the way home. All right, Catherine, what you want to eat? I don't know what you want to eat. I don't know. And argue with myself. And then there's the stress. I have a busy week ahead of me. Then I allow the stress to fall on me. 
Then conflict. Oh, Lord, let me walk in the house. If it's been a good church service and God dealt with me and delivered me of some things, you can walk into a house with those who don't go. I praise you, Jesus, they're going. And you can walk in and, and, and conflict will hit everywhere. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, what is this? And anger. How many times do we get angry as soon as we walk out the door? And it can be over something so silly. Why'd you throw that cough drop wrapper on the floor? Why is it on the floor? Why'd you do that? I just cleaned this car. Why'd you do that? Over silly things. We can't allow the Lord, you know, allow what the Lord has done to be sh- sh- shadowed and all that. We really need to be careful. Before you know it, we're in, we're so caught up in the rat race that we just we we're just like everyone else that we see. Those people that drive us crazy. If you have people in your life that drive you crazy, those certain people that just get on your nerves, take a look in the mirror. Because everything that drives you crazy about them is what God's trying to deal with in you. That's a big one. That is a big one. I had some friends that I would get so, I would just get aggravated. They talked nonstop. They would drive down. You're riding with them in the vehicle. You're driving down. I'm going to give you that. I'm going to give you that. I'm going to give And I'm going, the road, the road. And we're going on the side. And it's like, you know, you're hitting the boom, 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 boom. And there's 20 kids in the back. And you're trying to think of their lives, too. And you're seeing your life flash before you. And you're going, could you just watch the road? We can talk. Just watch the road. And I would get so frustrated. Little did I know. That when my daughter got in my car one day and we were talking, I'm like this with her. And she's like, mother, the road. So now I've trained myself. I don't do that. But the very thing that I did not like in that person was the very thing I do or did with people with me. So sometimes when you have those little instances, ask the Lord at that moment, Lord, okay, this person was really rubbing me the wrong way. What is it in me? that you see that drives you crazy, that you're trying to show me what it looks like in someone else to deal with in my own personal life. And he'll show you. But be willing to go there. Okay. You can go to the next slide. So. Oh, I'm not in here. I'll just have to do it from now. I was going to say, I don't see that slide. Oh, I found it. Somebody didn't check their papers. Okay, so the crux of the matter is this. God wants to clothe, clothe us in garments, but God leaves it up to us on what we want to put on. So what are you choosing to wear today? What are you choosing? You're standing in the closet, and I know women, we do this. Where's Olivia? I know Olivia does this. We stand there, we're going, I don't know what to put on. And you try on 50 things. Okay, yes, I do have several outfits on my bed right now because I couldn't figure out what to put on. When I ended up going back to the first thing that I chose to begin with. throw them in the laundry. Oh, no, ma'am, we don't. No, ma'am, no, ma'am. I learned. I do my own laundry. So I've learned that they can go back on the hanger and go back into the closet. They don't need to be washed. Okay? So anyway, people, you know, and, and I thought about this because when you think about what you're going to wear, there's people that will wear pink ribbons to indicate that they're standing for breast cancer. There's people that will wear the awareness ribbons for hope, which is the teal blue. Can I get you? And there's people that will wear the blues, you know, for childhood sexual abuse or for uh, child abuse. and So there's things that people do. We tie yellow ribbons around the tree or we'll wear yellow bracelets for the soldiers and stuff that are overseas. What if we were able to do something creative to distinguish ourselves as a disciple of Jesus Christ? What would you wear? We don't want to call attention to ourselves, but we want to let others know and to remind ourselves that we belong to Christ. What is something you can do creative? 
for me, I don't wear jewelry. But what I did do is I got a tattoo, and I know some people are against them, but my tattoo for me is, is it, it, this was a prophecy for me. It has three waves on it, three waves of healing that God took me through. It's my little bird with a voice. God has given me back my voice because I was told to hush for so many years. The word sore that's written on here with music notes. Sore is for survivors of abuse rising up. That's my everyday reminder. Survivors of abuse rising up. Well, how am I going to share that with somebody if I haven't risen? So I'm in the process of healing. I'm in the process of having that trauma taken from me and turned for the glory of God. So now I can stand up. And put on the garments of righteousness. Because all the trauma that I've ever been through, God has given me a robe of righteousness. He's removed the shame. He's removed the torment. He's removed the unforgiveness. He's removed the pain. And now I can stand and know that, Lord, only because of you, only because of you, Lord, I can stand. In righteousness. Okay. Now. So here's the bottom line. I had to break it up a little. So here's the bottom line. Rich, these are some costumes that I will be stitching. So anybody that would like one for his party. Here's the bottom line. We all know how embarrassing it is to show up at a function inappropriately dressed. I was going to go to a banquet in one of these. I just can't figure out which one I like. I like the candle. I like the blue. Okay. I knew Carly would like some of them. So what we need to remember, here's what we need to remember. What we need to remember is that the greatest function of all, the kingdom of God, is here and now. And we're expected to dress accordingly. Could you imagine, for a second, just get these images in your head, close your eyes for a second, you just received the invitation to the Lord's marriage supper, the feast, from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Imagine walking in and this is what you want. How do you think the Lord's going to look at you? I know I'm going to be looking at you funny, so just get over it. Okay, turn the next slide. So let us choose today the garments of Christ. Let's learn to clothe ourselves. And I want you to picture yourself as this young man. This is the way the man should have put on the garment for the wedding feast. He should have allowed the Lord to drape that garment of righteousness on him. We need to clothe, our, clothe ourselves in compassion Kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, love. In doing this, this honors and glorifies the king. How many are willing to glorify and honor the king? I'm willing to do whatever it takes. So stand to your feet. And we're going to pray. Lord, give me the words. And we're going to take off a few garments. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Lord. Father God, we just choose today to just come and and in whatever we're wearing, whether it be anger, whether it be malice, whether it be unforgiveness. And Father God, we want to allow you to remove these robes from us. So if you're wearing a robe right now, I want you to physically take your hands and take those robes off. Robes of unforgiveness. Robes of shame. Robes of false burdens. Just take it off of your shoulders right now. Robes of abuse. Robes of torment. 
robes of trauma. And Father God, I pray that you're standing behind each one of us right now. And Father God, I ask that you would take your hands and pick up the robe of righteousness, Father God, yes, and place it on each one of your children here. Yes. Father God, on each child that is watching yes. from Facebook, yes. Father God, give them the boldness to stand up where they are yes. and to take off, Father God, the old garments, but then allow you, Father God, to place on their shoulders the garments of righteousness. <clears throat> Father God, I thank you that you're putting on us, Lord, humility, compassion, kindness, Father God, and gentleness. Yeah. Father God, put on patience and love upon each one of us. <clears throat> Father God, have your way. And each and every person here and those watching. And Father God, I pray that the rest of this day, Father, that they would be reminded if something tries to come in. Oh, wait, I got rid of that garment. I'm now wearing this. I'm now wearing righteousness. Father God, go and minister to them where they are. And minister to your children here even as they leave this place. Holy Spirit, have your way. Everybody repeat after me. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, I receive, I receive this, garment of this garment of righteousness as the perfect garment, the perfect garment to, attend to attend the wedding feast. The wedding feast. And, Lord, and Lord, I will make sure I, make sure I, bring, I bring every person I meet to this feast with me. Yes. In Jesus' name. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Father, thank you for today. Yes. That's my sermon. So I hope you receive. So what are you wearing? That's my question. Yes, Lord Jesus, Jesus. You must have Lord, we just thank you, God, for your word, Lord. We thank you, God, that in some areas of our life, Lord, we 